Okay, so uh, today's lecture we're going to be uh, building on some remarks uh, at the close of the lecture last time on dealing with stochastics in these models. We're going to be going a bit light on some of the manipulations because we we uh, took a look at it at the end of the last lecture. And then we're going to be going on talking more about sensitivity analyses of various sorts. We've seen a variety of types of model, event models, system dynamics models, um, agent-based models, um, which are all uh, dynamic models, and models of change over time, with varying levels of detail uh, accompanying them. Some of those models are, are um, deterministic in the sense that you run the model one or more times, well, say two or two or more times with the same inputs, and you can expect reliably to get the, the same results. Others, however, uh, incorporate factors that are commonly regarded as stochastic. Um, frequently, these factors represent aspects of the world that we view as lying outside the scope of the model. Example would be um, uh, fluctuations in the stock market, um, rainfall levels, such as for a West Nile model, uh, oil prices, economic growth. Uh, our model has a delineated boundary, and there's a limit to how much we can represent. When it comes to agent-based models, there's often a lot of aspects of human behavior and human interactions which are treated as stochastic. That puts aside, in a pragmatic way, the issue of whether they're, in some sense, truly deterministic or, or um, stochastic. Um, and you could have arguments about uh, the role that you know, quantum, uh, quantum behavior may play or may not play in governing people's contact patterns. But the point remains is that we build models which only have a certain level of detail accompanying them. And frequently, things that lie outside the scope of the model, maybe not because they're lower level, but just because we don't have the requisite understanding to describe them, are often ascribed stochastic behavior within the model. So we associate them with um, uh, with distributions when running the model, or there's implicit distributions such as associated with rates within transitions in any logic from one state to another, or in terms of rates at which an event fires, or the picking of with which other neighbor a person contacts at a given um, interval of time. These might, we, might be things we regard as stochastic. And what we consider stochastic will depend on the scope of a model. So there'll be things you might depict as deterministic within a agent-based model, say, of infection diffusion, spread of, of awareness of a new product. Um, you may, you may uh, depict things quite explicitly within a, an agent-based model. Um, and, things that would otherwise be depicted as or considered as sort of stochastic from a, a higher level model. Example would be the structure of uh, social networks. We might specify those quite explicitly and in a deterministic way within an agent-based model, even though uh, from the standpoint of a stock and flow model, we might view those contact patterns as, um, as stochastic. So, um, Within uh, any logic, uh, two of the three sorts of dynamic modeling we've looked at in this class incorporate features that are such that they are typically stochastic. Um, and uh, those are the agent-based method and the discrete event method. And I've listed some of the ways that um, agent-based method here um, would be stochastic, the first three. Um, for discrete event models, uh, there's a variety of ways in which it would be stochastic. One is just how long a given procedure will take. So if we have a model of this process by which someone gets treated, there's going to be a question of, you know, how long does a given procedure take? Maybe it's an examination with an ophthalmoscope for, for an ophthalmology clinic, for example, or the duration of a surgery. That duration would typically be drawn from a distribution of some sort. And uh, there's a wide variety of distributions, as we know, that any logic makes available. Another example in the discrete event context where there's stochastics or there's uncertainty would be um, uh, which, uh, which resource is assigned to a given person. 
Remember, we view the resources associated with an entity as coming from a set of uh, a pool of, of resource units that are interchangeable. And which particular resources obtained is typically immaterial. It's, it's drawn randomly. Now, we can, in fact, associate some information with particular resource units that represents, for example, accumulation of information on what fraction of the time they're in use. And so, you know, this, um, this issue of resource units being totally interchangeable may not be true from the standpoint of analysis. We may be interested in variability in resource use. But which particular room, procedure room, is, it, is, it, is given to a particular patient, for example, or which particular doctor sees a patient in an emergency room would typically be treated as, as stochastic. There are ways around that, but that's sort of the traditional treatment. Um, and as a result of this, there's going to be variation from simulation to simulation when we run our model. When we run our model, we're going to see slight differences in results. Maybe it's the fracture of time of given resources in use. Maybe it's who's the last person remaining uninfected in that very first agent-based simulation we ran where it spreads within is some field. Maybe it's a question of who starts infected. Now, when we're running these models, um, we often seek to identify regularities um, that we can count on in the results. The models will be of really limited value if, Every time we ran them, they gave totally different results. They wouldn't, really wouldn't confer that much value. We're looking for, for certain aspects of their results that are more uh, consistent or more constant or more, uh, more reliable. And to gain confidence in, and to understand to what degree a given aspect of the results we're seeing is something we can count on and to what degree it may merely be a fluke, of the dice that were rolled. You know, maybe we rolled snake eyes and, and we saw something that was quite unusual in a given simulation. To gain confidence that what we've seen is an aspect of a regularity of the emergent behavior, we typically run what's called the Monte Carlo Ensemble of Realizations. Okay? Um, and uh, Monte Carlo Ensembles, uh, Monte Carlo Methods, are methods that draw repeated samples from distributions and stochastic processes, drawing from random variables over time, of interest. And, and they'll draw those distributions again and again and again. Here, the stochastic process we're simulating out is, in fact, the model execution. Um, and when conducting a Monte Carlo approach, we'll run a collection of different runs, a so-called Monte Carlo ensemble of runs. Um, so when we do that, we'll typically deal with mean standard deviations, empirical fractiles of these. We'll ask, what's the range of values, for example, within which 50% of all runs lie or 95% of all runs lie? We'll ask about what's the mean value uh, resulting from this simulation. Um, typically, there's there are regularities between runs. We may find that those bands are very tight and very regular. We may also find, however, that they're surprising. For example, we may see the results from our simulation exhibit real asymmetries. So it may have a long tail on the upper side. The cost could go very, very high, but we're very confident they won't go below a certain value. So, you know, we may have learning that goes on associated with these um, uncertainties. A very important point here as well is that at a crude level, and, and, you know, we could take issue with this philosophically, but at a crude level, to the degree that the model is sort of an abstract representation of the world, we're sort of viewing one realization of the world. There's uncertain things in the world, at least from the level of abstraction, we're approaching it from um, within the model. And um, there's going to be variability. If we look at data on the number of gonorrhea cases over time in Saskatchewan, what you'll see is variability year to year. If we look at data on the number of automobile accidents within a year, there'll be variability. And 
you know, as you're looking at shorter and shorter periods of time, that variability may grow more and more pronounced because of sampling or small, small numbers. You may get really pronounced variability. One nice advantage that we can gain with a Monte Carlo approach is some sense as to the explanation for that variability, the degree to which those patterns of striking changes we may see, say, in gonorrhea data year to year, to what degree those are, those are simply stochastics resulting from the nature of the situation, and to what degree are those actually hidden aspects of some regularity? To what degree are those unusual? Well, we can use a Monte Carlo ensemble to, to look at the variability we would expect just from sort of chance playing out in terms of you know, who's meeting who, uh, partnering with who, et cetera. And we can try to judge if that variability is kind of a, that we see in the empirical data is comparable to what we see in the model. If so, we have an explanation. In another study that we undertook, we saw quite a bit of variability in certain empirical data. We had a hypothesis that there was an overall upwards trend, but sometimes, whoa, sometimes we'd see several years in a row where, in fact, the values were declining. And we wanted to know, okay, are those declines in values we're seeing, is that something else that's going on? Is it something we need to worry about? Is it something our model doesn't really account for? Or is it somehow just a reflection of the stochastics in the external world? And uh, what we found, in fact, what we found, in fact, was that um, if we looked at the types of statistics we were gathering, which were age-specific counts of the number of individuals with, with diabetes um, for, for certain age ranges. What we found is that the nature of those statistics was such that if we collected them in our model, we saw those same sort of patterns that we saw in the external world, even if our model had overall trending upwards rates of diabetes. In other words, even if we posited in the model that rates are rising, we would sometimes see multiple years, quite commonly multiple years where it declines. So those variability, that variability we saw from the external world was in fact accounted for very regularly by the nature of the statistics we were collecting. We could simulate those statistics in the model and see that the nature of those statistics, age-specific statistics, is such that you tend to get these stochastic patterns. So. So this use of Monte Carlo methods is not merely a way of dealing with a shortcoming of these models, the, the pesky nuisance that they have, that they exhibit this variability, but it's actually a way of explaining patterns we see in the, more, in the world more generally, patterns of variability year to year. Um, so here, we're typically reasoning not over outputs from a single simulation, like we've tended to run thus far, but data from a wide variety of simulations, from a collection of simulations that are assumed to be in no particular order. Um, so here, the tools of statistical inference and descriptive statistics are very, very valuable. So we may ask, for example, we see some historic value. Instead of asking, does the model match that value, we'll ask, okay, um, you know, does this, does this historic value fall within the 95% interval empirical fractile around the median that we see from the model? So is it extremely unlikely that we'd see this historic value according to the model? If so, we might challenge the model. Or we might look at the mean differences in results between interventions. So in short, when we have this variability, it behooves us to run collections of runs using what are called Monte Carlo methods and, and to then reason about the variability we see across those runs using summary measures like means and medians standard deviations, et cetera, and looking at the historic data in that context. Um, we, might, we might draw out a band of 95% confidence interval or maybe 50% confidence interval around the median and plot out the historic data and see if it falls within that. Okay. So 
when we look at results from a model, running a model again and again and again, we, we could display each trajectory of the model, each output of the model just on top of that graph. But that quickly gets messy. And so we're going to be revisiting something we saw in the closing moments of the last, um, the last lecture, which is uh, presenting this data in 2D histograms, where one of the axes is what? Why don't, why don't you folks answer me on that? So in a 2D histogram of the sort we saw last time, what are the axes? 2D, so we have bins in two dimensions. A normal histogram, we'd have bins, if we had a 1D histogram, we have bins, right? We divide this, this axis up into bins, and we count the number of occurrences that lie in each of those bins, right? Neil, I'm drawing something on the board here. I'm just drawing a histogram of a very broad uh, inchoate distribution. Um, Okay, so a 2D histogram, we have a grid. We have two dimensions, not one. So each of these axes is divided up into bins, and we count the number of occurrences that fall within each of these squares, each of these bins, which here are sort of squares in this grid. And last time, ladies and gentlemen, we saw a 2D histogram. What was the x-axis? Time. Yeah, it was time. Time. And the y-axis was a value of some sort. Value of output from the model, some output from the model, right? And if a given trajectory went through these, you know, through, went through the space in some way, we would go and we would count the number of intersections that trajectory made with each bin. So, you know, it would increment this bin by, by one, it would increment this bin by one, it would increment this bin by one, it would increment this bin by one because it's going through those squares. And so we've divided up the, the space into these set of squares. We, using fancy terms, we've tessellated the space, and we, we increase um, by one the number of uh, any squares which this trajectory passes. Crudely speaking, that's kind of what we're doing with the 2D histogram. And as it turns out, the 2D histogram will allow us to display that data, or it will allow us to display what are called empirical fractiles, okay? So we've just talked about this uh, 2D histogram, divides up this, this axis. Um, and together, the divisions define this, this grid. And, and in fact, there's uh, data stored in a 2D data set that, um, that lies behind this uh, uh, 2D, uh, uh, 2D histogram. So I'd like you to load in the model that which we had loaded last time, which is the uh, SAR agent-based calibration model. Many of you may have that loaded already um, because it, it was up in our AnyLogic last time. And we're going to go through some aspects of this model here so that we better understand how it will work. And we're starting to get into territory, which is going to be helpful for that third <coughs> problem of problem set three which focuses on calibration, but we're going to see a lot of these mechanisms play a role. Um, it, the learning from here will carry over to that, some of the learning. Okay, so SAR HMAS calibration, again, it's from the help example models, if you want to go to it there. And what we saw last time, and I think I actually frogged it a little bit, um, uh, so we're going to have to go down here. I went to the um, this experiment, which is a um, parameter variation experiment, and my frobbing was just just focused on this area. So I'm going to unfrob it. Okay, um, defrob it. Um, okay. So what we saw is a let me let me clear away the deer because the deer are 
are not tuned into this particular discussion. Um, so here we go, uh, Monte Carlo 2D histogram. And we saw that um, we could run this model. Uh, draw, each time we run it, we use a different so-called random number seed. So we, we have a different realization produced. And here we are going to use freeform parameters where we simply run this again and again and again with the same set of parameter values 200 times, okay, uh, this value over here. Um, we could, of course, specify a fixed seed, but it would, uh, unless there's something unusual in how we're doing random numbers in our model, it would yield the same results every time. What's important is that we have the random, random seed here, okay? Um, and if we were to run it in this way, what we would see is a, um, is a curve uh, filled in over time, uh, which, which exhibits some variability around some, some median. Um, so it looks something like, like, well, okay, this one is, is steeper, it looks like, um, here. So maybe I have somewhat different values um, than, than what I'm showing in this display. Okay, I'd like you to go look at the data set behind it. So remember what we what we introduced last time. What is a data set? Who can tell me what a data set is? What is a data set's purpose in life? What does it store? It stores data. <laughs> <laughs> a, a fine a fine point. Um, indeed, it's. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'd really be worried. <laughs> yes. Uh, Well-spoken, young man. Um, and so it stores data. And uh, you got to have pity on me sometimes. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it stores data. And here we're storing data in two dimensions because we're storing bin data in one dimension and another. And you'll notice that we define here intervals, okay? So we define horizontal intervals, um, 80 of them from 0 to 200. And we define uh, vertical interval, uh, intervals from 0 to 8,040 of them, okay? Um, what's, what's notable here is that that delineates the kind of this grid that we're going to be displaying using the Monte Carlo 2D histogram uh, chart. Okay. This, this defines that underlying grid on which we're going to be accumulating statistics. Okay. Um, now, to see how this works, I, I noted last time, so we got a, a very good question last time from one of our remote attendees. And the question was, um, how do you accumulate data between runs? I mean, I'm, I'm boiling it down and rephrasing it, but... But if you're running the model twice, three times, four times, can you accumulate data between those runs? And the issue here is that the main class comes and the main class goes. The main class object is created at the beginning of a simulation, a given realization. In other words, a single run with a single random number seed we call a realization. It starts at the beginning of that realization. It goes out of existence at the end of that realization. It disappears. It vamooshes. And any data that's in there either needs to be saved away to a database or saved away to a file or some other place, or it will be lost. So if we want to accumulate data from run to run, for example, to compare the outputs of two runs, or to gather statistics from an ensemble of runs, a collection of these, excuse me, when I say runs, these realizations. We want to gather data from an ensemble of realizations of a given, in this case, I mean realizations of a given model with the same parameter values, just with different random number seeds. To do that, we need a place to store that data. And ladies and gentlemen, that data is going to be stored in a special class of experiment. And there's two classes we will examine fittingly in this class, in this course. 
First, we're examining now, and that's a parameter variation experiment, okay? A parameter variation experiment. You can see that's what this experiment is, um, parameter variation experiment. And it's just a different type of experiment that you do new, add, experiment, and you can choose parameter variation, okay? Um, so what we're going to do is we have this data set, and this data set, data infected 2D, this 2D hit data set is going to accumulate information from across multiple runs because for every new realization, it's going to add counts to those bins, and it's going to do so for all 200 realizations that we're going to be running. Those 200 realizations we told it that we care about back at this point, this number of runs, okay? Okay, um, so this Monte Carlo 2D histogram experiment is unlike the other experiments we've dealt with. How them, it's unlike them, its job in life is not just to run a single run of the model, a single run of it with, and, and where the main class comes to existence, disappears, and that's it. Instead, it's going to run many such experiments, okay, or many such, uh, such runs. <coughs> now, in this case, they're just different realizations with the same parameter values. In other cases, we may change parameter values. We're going to come to that probably later today, okay? So, this data infectious 2D has got to accumulate this information. Now, to, to be clear about this, any, any logic uses some terminology, but unfortunately it uses them, at least in this version, somewhat inconsistently. So we call an experiment a collection of simulations. The experiments we've used earlier in the class have just one simulation in them each, but here we're getting to the point where you have multiple simulations. And a simulation can consist of a collection of, of further replications of the model, which are each undertaken such as for different realizations, okay? Um, and a replication is one run of the model. Most commonly, for everything we've seen thus far, an experiment equals a simulation equals a replication. There was no distinction made between them. Each experiment simply ran one experiment, one simulation within that experiment, one replication within that. Now we're getting to the point where we're going to at least have multiple simulations within an experiment, and we might have multiple replications within each simulation for statistical reasons, okay? Um, okay, so I've, I've talked about how in most cases they are, um, um, uh, we, we've treated them the same. Okay, so let's go see how do we accumulate this data from run to run to run. To see that, I want you to go to that experiment, and I want you to go to the properties and go to the advanced tab. And what you'll see is that there's a salvage operation taking place there. So if we go to this particular experiment, this parameter variation experiment, and we go to advanced, what we will see here is some extra fields on what to do around these simulations, okay? So you'll notice here, these, the, the terminology in these relate to exactly what I've talked about. An experiment contains multiple simulations. Before each experiment run, do what? And then before each, after each simulation run, do it. So in this case, we're going to have one experiment running. And before we run that experiment, we're going to clear any data that's already in this data, data infectious 2D. These bins, we're going to clear them out. Maybe we're restarting it, you know, after if we run it once, we stop it, and then we've got to run it again. And we don't want that older data to contaminate it. So here... We are going to reset this data infectious 2D. And then after each simulation, after each realization run, in this case, after each time we run the model, it runs through, it accumulates some data. We're going to extract that data that's accumulated, and we're going to put it into this thing called data infectious 2D. Okay? Now, this, ladies and gentlemen, is a carryover to that problem three of problem set three. It's one of the key things that's going on there. There's some other things in the context of calibration we'll get to, but this is one of the key ones. The point here is where do, from where does it take that data? From whence does that data come? 
it comes from the main class. Before the main class is destroyed, any logic allows you to run this after simulation run so that you can get the requisite information from that main class. You can salvage what you need from that. If there's some data you need there that hasn't been stored away to a database or to a file, you can get it here. Okay, so this is thing called root, and root refers to this main object. And we're going in and we're actually getting a data set within that main class. So if we go up here to main, let's go up main, let's go down main, um, here we go, and we'll find that there's an infectious DS data set. We actually saw this, robbed this uh, a time or two ago. So this data set infectious 2D, this was back when the world was simple and there was just one main, and main was kind of the biggest thing we had to think about. Um, the longest lived thing we have to think about. We store data away in this infectious 2DS. And you may remember this, um, it had a recurrence time of two, and it basically measured, um, uh, measured this value of this variable and infectious, et cetera, okay? And it automatically, every two times units, it's sampled from an infectious. It just sampled there. So while the simulation was running, that's what's going on. And nothing in the experiment changes that. It's just when this thing finishes, when this finishes running one of its runs under this experiment, what's going to happen is when that finishes, it's going, all that data that was accumulated gets salvaged and it gets added to this data set here, this data set that lives right over in, in this parameter variations experiment. So it gets just added into that, okay? So in short, we're taking all the data on the observations that we recorded and we're adding it in here to this uh, 2D data set, okay? Um, and we're accumulating in this sort of fashion over time. So, um, right, any questions about that point? Does that make sense to people? Why you have to do that? So we're adding it to that two D data set. That's just oh, because we're resetting it. We're effectively just replacing the data with. Okay, the reset occurred before the experiment runs. So before any of the runs within it, it's just clearing it all out, starting with a clean slate. And then after each simulation, see this says before each experiment run. So it's cleaning it out, wiping the slate clean. And then it's going to run these 200 experiments in this case, right? Excuse me, these 200 simulations. So for each simulation, it goes off to Maine. It says, hey, Maine, run it with these parameters. And Maine goes and does its job. And it gets back this infectious DS and – excuse me, that's a, that's a different name than we just saw. I just want to make sure this is uh, consistent. Um, this is DS infectious uh, that was there. And in Maine, we have, um, let's go with that embedded out analysis data. Okay, this is called infectious DS with a capital. Okay, so, so what is going on there? Um, it's kind of throwing me off my slide. Oh, infectious DS, yes. It's just an inconsistency with the slide, sorry. Um, so it's infectious DS. It's, it's the data set there. So, it has done its job. Maine has run its course. It's accumulated this data, and now it it takes this in by this add. It's add not in a – well, it's add in the sense that, okay, here's some new data. Here's a 1D histogram. Go increment – excuse me, not a 1D histogram. Here's data over time. At this time, it had this value. At that time, it had that value. At this other time, it had this value. Now go and increment the bins within this 2D histogram so that those are counted. Does that make sense? So, so in other words, um, you know, this infectious DS here is going to have some that, – that data set, you may recall, we have time values, we had time, and then for, for different points in time, it measured the number of infectious individuals. Um, and it's going to go then and enter that data into this 2D histogram by incrementing the bins. It'll say, oh, this guy here at time 20 
you know, his value was was you know uh, thirty seven point two or something like that. Well, this is this is people We're in a discrete world here. So this is thirty seven people. Um, uh, and so it would go here, and it would look up, okay, for time 20, it's kind of this time bin, and maybe this is the bin between 35 and 40 or something like that. So it would go increment this, uh, this grid square, the count associated with that. Does that make sense? Um, and that's what that, the semantics of this add are. Good question. Other questions? Question? No? Okay. Okay, so so let's continue to talk about this. Now, what we've talked about is the mechanism. Just the fact that we have this 2D histogram, the fact to feed the 2D histogram, we have this kind of superstructure that runs these simulations within an experiment and provides us a way to reach in after each such simulation, get the data out and, and record it, in this case in our 2D histogram. We might record it in other ways. Maybe we want to total up, you know, for each point in time, the number that have been there. That's all we care about, in which case we could do whatever we wanted, you know, at, at this point. We could, we could stick this data in a database. We could go combine it in some weird nonlinear way with whatever we have, we could do whatever on it. But the point is it provides a way of doing that. And in this case, we stuff it into a 2D histogram. That's not particularly privileged though. Okay, so now we're gonna switch to talk about this 2D histogram a little bit more. I'd like you to focus, we already talked about the data set, this, D, this data infectious 2D, okay? I'd like now to turn our attention to the chart. This data infectious 2D, it delineated the kind of grids that we want to use. And then there's something that we're going to come back to in just a minute we haven't really talked about. Let's go look at this chart. So this chart says to display data from that data infectious 2D. And that gives us a choice. Should we show bins or show envelopes? Okay. Okay, I'm going to first talk about the show bins option. Okay. And then I'll come back to the show envelopes because I think show bins is a little bit more conceptually, conceptually um, satis or easier to understand. So if we have um, show bins on, uh, we might see from a variety of runs something like the following. Uh, so for a given point in time, we can imagine slicing through this graph of output and we'd see a histogram. This histogram would be, this is not a particularly great, uh, uh, great view of it, but um, uh, there's, there's a long tail on the lower side of this that I, that I don't show in my crude sort of diagram there. But basically, if we slice through this and we were to kind of go along here for a given point in time, so we're slicing from, you know, up from along this arrow and so on, this particular region of it is shown here, but this this here would be a long sort of dull plateau of, of zeros. And then once you get into this region, we, you know, we basically see a histogram that sort of is low and then goes high and then goes low and then goes a bit higher and then higher yet and then down again and then up and down. And whoa, it's displaying the, the bin, the bin counts here, okay? Um, how many things fell into each of these bins. And it looks like here, the, the vertical width, the width in terms of values is thinner ver uh, visually than the horizontal width, the width in terms of time. So these time durations are sort of more coarser grained, okay? But if we slice through it, we get a histogram, a 1D histogram. At any point in time, there's kind of a 1D histogram through this distribution. What we're just looking at is those sort of stacked up 1D histograms. So that's all well and good, and a show bins method will actually show you the count using different levels of darkness scale for each of those bins within the diagram, okay? So, so it will show you these bins in these grids, in this grid that have been accumulated, how big are they? The darker they are, the bigger the count, okay? Um, 
Okay, so that's the show bins. Let's talk about show envelopes, okay? Um, so you'll notice that we have these, uh, these two choices, show envelopes and show bins. Um, show envelopes basically shows you what are called empirical fractals, okay? And uh, you may find it helpful to think if you've developed intuitions for notions of confidence intervals, these may remind you some of confidence intervals, although there's some underlying kind of conceptual differences between what's going on. These are envelopes in which a certain fraction of all cases fell, okay? Um, so uh, if we said 25, it means the boundary between the lowest and the second lowest quartile. Um, so that's the 25th sort of... Uh, 25th percentile, 50 means uh, at the median, and basically these define envelopes or contours around the median within which data from different percentages of realizations fall, okay? Um, and if we slice through it, we get something like a box plot. Um, so uh, here, what we're basically doing is we're summarizing how far from the median different fractions of the entire data set fell. So if you look at the data set infectious 2D, this thing I glossed over before stands out. So we have these envelopes, and here it says 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.75. So, so when I said um, uh, this, this should really say um, 0.25, this should really say 0 0.5. To be um, to be consistent with that. Okay. Oops. Um, okay. So so here what we're saying is one envelope should go from essentially should be marked at 0 0.5, another at at, at 0.5, another at 0.75, so that we can basically find okay what fraction sort of fall within within those categories. And this is the sort of thing that we'll see. Okay. Um, so, so here, this 0.25, uh, what we'll see is 75% is, uh, fell within this outermost range, okay? Um, and then in, uh, within the next uh, innermost range, we're going to have something like 50% uh, uh, fell. The next inner range, something like 25, 25% uh, filled. And we can map this to a box plot. I don't know how many of you are familiar with box plots, but a box plot will show the median. The upper and lower edges of the boxes are at the 25th and 75th percentile of all cases fall within this range around the median. And then the these whiskers show the, the biggest value received and the lowest value received. Um, so we've, we've got something like that going on. Um, so so the, the upper one would be zero and 100% and specified. Um, so here we can show arbitrarily many envelopes. And um, you'll note that these are contiguous. In other words, they're, um, they're all centered around the median. Importantly, folks, if you look at this, look at this point uh, just after 20, this has a single mode to it. It sort of rises and then falls. So, so what we're showing is around the median, sort of where different fractions of all cases uh, lie. Um, if we looked at the bin case, what we'd see is at that same point, we have this bifurcation. Okay? We have this sort of this is higher, then it's lower, then it's higher. But when you view it as sort of fractiles around the median, the median may lie here. What is the median, folks? Remind me of what a median is. We have a distribution. What's the median of that distribution? It's the point at which what? Half the population on one side, half the other. Exactly, exactly. So for certain distributions, the median is mode, and the mode is the most likely value or the most likely the highest density value. But in this case, we might have the median right here. It's not particularly likely value in and of itself, but half lies above, half lies 
below it. And if we have that case, then if we request empirical fractals, we'll get something like this. If we request envelopes, we'll get something like this. And these just show you know, how far out you have to go that larger and larger fractions of all cases fall, fall within that. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay. Um, I want to talk. Uh, yes. Okay. Right. Um, I think I'll come back to this. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll, I'll make this uh, this point right now. If you go to the replications tab associated with the uh, parameter variations experiment, you'll actually see um, see a question about whether you should you should use replications. Okay, and um, basically, if if you if you say yes, you have the option of either using a fixed number of runs per simulation. That allows you to compute like the mean over those runs, or you can have a varying number um, when a certain confidence interval is is uh, says confidence level is achieved when there's a certain um, accuracy. And I do think I'll come back to this uh, when it comes to, to calibration because it's more important. But I want to more important there. But I want to talk a little bit about um, the statistics of this. So if we're taking the sample mean of n samples. So if we're taking n realizations, if we're running this model n times, and we're taking the mean around each one, it turns out that to get twice as much, to, to, to increase our, to decrease the uh, variability in our estimate of the mean by a factor of two, we have to perform how many more, or how many times the number of simulations. So if we do n, and we have a certain level of uncertainty about where the mean lies, to divide that by a number of two, how many samples do we have to take total? We have to take four times that number of samples to halve it. Okay. Let's let's talk about that a little bit. So if we have some samples that are independent, okay. Um, then the variation of x plus y is just a very, very excuse me, the variance of x plus y is just the variance of x plus the variance of y. Okay. So if we have samples of two random variables um, and we sum them up, sum these samples up, variability is just the variance of each one plus each other. Now, if we have n independent samples from distribution x, then the variance of of the sum of those if they're independent, it's just n times the variance of, of this distribution x. Okay? Um, however, if we scale a random variable, if we draw from the random variable and scale it by a factor alpha, then, and we ask, what's the variance of alpha times a draw from x? Then it turns out the variance of that is alpha squared times the variance of x. So if we're just drawing one sample and scaling it, Turns out the, the variance goes up with the square of sort of that, that scaling factor, alpha. Okay. Um, so in short, if we take n independent samples from x, the variance of their sum is n times the variance of x. But if we take just one sample from x and we multiply it times n, the variance of that is n squared times the variance of x, the variance of the distribution x. So this is very, very different. If we just take n times one sample, well, of course it's going to be more variable because there's all we're doing is taking one single sample. The errors aren't canceling like they are when we're summing up many independent samples. And so there's going to be more variability. And in fact, it goes up with the square of this thing we're multiplying it by, n times a single sample, the variance of that will be and squared times the variance of the distribution we're drawing from. So this actually explains the scaling of the sample mean. So if we take, if we want to take the mean, we want to run the model a certain number of times and take the mean of those values, let's suppose for the number of people in fact, just or what have you. Um, here we're running the model many times, say n times, and we want to take the mean of these so we divide by n, right? We sum up the number of infectious people in each of these runs, we divide by n, 
we get a mean value, okay? Um, well, if we do that, what is, the, and we can ask, what's the variance of this? What's the variance associated with that statistic of this, this mean? How variable is it? Um, well, using the variance as our measure, we have variance of this sample here. It's just the variance of this guy here. That's how it's defined. Okay, that's fine enough. And the variance of this guy here, well, we've seen what that is. The variance of the sum of n independent samples from x is what, ladies and gentlemen? The variance of the sum of these guys for drawing n different ones independently from this, from this value here. We sum them up. The variance of n sums of that is, what is the variance of that? It is... It is the standard deviation squared, that's true. But we're actually going to be driving the standard deviation from the variance by taking the square root of the variance. What, what it actually is, from what I said in the last slide, it's n times the variance of a single one of these. So again, if we're summing up independent samples from random variables, they simply, the variance of the sum is the sum of the variance. Okay? So if we have n samples, better not pound this, if we have n samples from, from the, this distribution x, the variance of that sum is n times the variance of uh, a single draw from x, okay? n times the variance of that, associated with that random variable x. But meanwhile, we're dividing this thing by n. And so the variance of alpha times a sample from x is just what? Tell me. Please. Please. Oh, man. Ladies and gentlemen, I said it earlier. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say it again. If we scale a random variable by a factor alpha, the variance scales by alpha squared. If we have variance of alpha times a single draw from a random variable x, the variance of that quantity of alpha times that thing is alpha squared times the variance of x. So alpha is 1, it's just 1 times the variance of x. It's, it is itself. On the other hand, if we're doubling x, if it's 2 times two times the draw from x, we want to ask, what's the variance associated with that? It's, it's actually 2 squared, or 4 times the variance of just that draw from x. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, with that in mind, please keep it in mind for 10 seconds at least. If we have that, and we have this thing divided by n, it's the same as multiplying times 1 over n, what is the variance of, if we have some quantity, we have some variance associated with that quantity, call that quantity y, and we have 1 over, and now we want to associate, look at the variance of 1 over n times this draw from y, What's the variance of that? Please tell me. Please. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have 1 over n times some quantity, which has variability associated with it, a y. Alpha is 1 over n. And we want to see what is the variance associated with that. Variance associated with that is alpha squared, or 1 over n squared, times the variance associated with this thing. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we have 
the variance of this guy here, this quantity here, equal 1 over n squared times the variance of this thing. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's just this identity here, alpha being 1 over n, and therefore alpha squared being 1 over n squared, times the variance of whatever the variance of x is. And the variance of this guy, we already said it's the sum of independent samples. So variance of sum up of n of these is just n times the variance of x. So we have n times the variance of x over n squared. So the, vari the variance associated with the sample mean, which is arguably the most important statistic out there, if you want to run your model many times, say 100 times, and you want to take the sample mean of that, what's the variance associated with that compared to the variance of a single run? Well, the variance associated with that is 100th of the variance associated with with a single run. This draw from it, okay? So if I want to output the number of people, cumulative number of people that were infected by the end of the simulation, and I do my simulation run 100 times, and I take the mean of that, I'm doing 100 runs to estimate this mean. There's some variability from run to run in the number of people infected at the end. The variability in that sample, which is involved 100 runs and taking the mean of it, is just a hundredth of the variability of a single, that var variability in the output, the number of cumulative infected people from a single run. Okay, and that means, ladies and gentlemen, this goes to Dylan's point, the standard deviation rises or drops is the square root of n. The variance drops is 1 over n. The standard deviation, which is a linear measure of dispersion, kind of linear in the same sense we can kind of compare it with the mean, ask what fraction of the mean is the standard deviation. It actually varies as 1 over the square root of n. So if we want to decrease, if we have some variability from run to run to run in the number of infectious people, and we want to reduce that by a factor of 2, we've got to run four times as many simulations. If we want to reduce it by a factor of, of 10, we've got to run 100 times as many simulations. It's a pretty big burden sometimes. We want to reliably calculate that mean. Reliably calculate it for, say, for an intervention. We want to compare is this intervention better than that one on average. Well, maybe we've run each one once. How do we know we're not fooling ourselves? Maybe it says A is greater than B. But maybe the next time we run it, B will be greater than A. And we run it again. First time it says A is greater than B. Second time we run it, it says A is greater than B again. Well, should we take that at face value and say, well, A must be better than B? Maybe there's, maybe that's just chance. Maybe we flipped the dice twice and we happened, flipped a coin twice, we got heads twice. Run it again, run it again. How much of that running do we have to do until we're very, very confident A is better than B? This, this is an indication of that. If we can figure out those error bars, that uncertainty around the mean, the sample mean, the sample mean being sort of the, the mean over our different runs of the statistic of interest, the number of people, in fact, cumulative number of people, in fact, for the simulation. If we can figure out the error bars around that, then we can start to figure out, okay, when are those getting small enough that we can say with confidence A is greater than B? It's not just chance. Well, if we want to reduce those error bars by a factor of two, if we want to reduce the uncertainty around about where the sample mean lies by a factor of two, we need to run four times as many simulations. So we might run those two simulations each. We see the variability associated with each. We say, wow, that's a lot of variability. So from a 
associated with this. Let's let's run 100 runs, see what that variability is. You run 100 runs, you still find there's there's significant variability in the result. Well, to, to shrink those envelopes around them, associated with the error bars in which, say, 95% of the, the runs lie, proportion around the sample mean, you're going to need to, gonna, if you want to shrink it by factor two, you're going to need to quadruple. This is an important consideration. This is, this is something that basically modelers should know. To have that uncertainty, to have that width of those envelopes around the sample mean, you need to run four times as many simulations. You might run those and then say, do we need more? How many more do we need? This, this can help you get some judgments. Any questions about this? Yeah. I'm not sure how to word it. So, uh Essentially, what you're saying is, uh, if you have uh, 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 so basically the envelope is you want to reduce the errors around uh, yeah. uh, the error bars. But so if you want to reduce those by half, yeah. then you're saying you you uh, you take it four times. So that's right. So oh, okay. So, so, so so we might associate error bars like going out. We we have the mean, and then the the sample mean the the kind of mean over, let's suppose we've run the simulation 10 times, right? So we've run our simulation 10 times, and you found that, you know, the mean number of viruses that are, that, that computer viruses that make their way into company A, you know, uh, a given policy A, you know, into the company, okay? You find the mean there. And, and you might derive, uh, the mean associated with that, and you might derive a, so you've computed that mean, and there's some, that, that mean has some variability associated with it, right? Like, um, it's going to bounce around for the first 10, you know, first one's going to be, is maybe larger, and second one may be smaller, and, third, and, and the sample mean, the mean, you know, over those first two, and first three, and first four, that's going to be bouncing around as well, but it's going to be it's going to be getting more and more, less and less bouncing around over time. And the question is, how many of those runs do you have to do to kind of give you a range of uncertainty that you're comfortable with? And you could go out, say, two standard deviations. You could take the, the um, empirical standard deviation uh, around this, uh, this uh, sample mean. Well, we've seen what the standard deviation is around the mean, right? Um, standard deviation for the underlying process, which typically we don't know exactly, but we could try to estimate, divide by the square root of n. So we could, we could actually estimate the, the, um, the standard deviation around this mean statistic, say go out two standard deviations in either side, maybe that's our error bar that we want to use, okay? That's our kind of width of uncertainty associated with it. And we may do that for, you know, how many viruses are cumulative number of viruses that made their way into the company throughout the simulation for policy A, and then we do it for policy B, and we find that policy A has uh, seems to have a higher mean than policy B, but they're really overlapped in terms of the the error bars. Like if you go out two standard deviations, what you'll see is that there, there's a large amount of overlap between them, and so you know you're not really sure. Is, is, is policy A really with great deal of confidence better than policy B? And what I'm saying is you could shrink those, those uh, error bars by a factor of two by running each one four times as many simulations, okay? And you could do so until they no longer overlap. So from going like this, they start going like this and this, and, you know, probably the... That's a horrible way to... So... Um, Gosh, I, I don't have enough anatomical parts to do this well or enough flexibility. But, you know, we, we may have two means. You know, take my knuckles as the means, right? Um, and, uh, and each time we run more and more, these are becoming sort of smaller and smaller. At some point, they're going to be separated. So, you know, um, there's going to be no, no overlap in the error bars. So 95% confidence sort of around each sample mean 
there's going to be no overlap. And we might take that as a, as a firm indication that with high confidence, A, you know, A yields better results than B. D does that address? Okay. Further questions on that? But, you know, key point here is shrinking by factor two requires more than you might think the amount of work. Four times as much, not just double, four times as much. Okay? Okay. Um, okay, and um, I noted earlier, by the way, this is, a, this is an example, uh, example from a consulting project that I did some years ago now, but um, uh, what you see is, is real asymmetry sometimes in these distributions. This is from Gunsum, actually. Gunsum could do these empirical fractals. And, and you'll see the, the median in here in black. Um, and uh, what you see is on the upper side, the costs can be much, much higher than the median, but they can't be that much lower, for example. And, and that's the sort of insight you can sometimes get just by looking at variability. So you're not always just interested in the mean. You're interested in also sort of where is that variable? Where does it lie, um, you know, on, on what side? So anyway, this is um, uh, one indication. Uh, it, it bears noting that while we're talking about uncertainty here, we earlier looked at a technique by integration of, of decision analysis and um, – and simulation modeling on how we could actually integrate um, uh, decision making with uncertainty over time. And so uh, we should.